Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Monastery Mornings, My Unusual Boyhood Among the Saints and Monks by Michael P. O'Brien. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the publicist here at Paraclete, and we're so happy to have you all with us to celebrate this beautiful book today. If you would just take a second to find the chat bar or the Q&A button or the raise your hand button, we'll have time later on for some Q&A with Michael. Michael Patrick O'Brien is a Catholic writer and lawyer living in Salt Lake City. He's married to Vicki, a preschool teacher, and they have three adult children and one adorable little grandchild. Monastery Mornings has been described as a love letter to this particular community of Trappist monks up in the mountains of Utah. Mike's story is so personal and so full of hope. I'm just going to read a few things that um, people have said about Monastery Mornings. Judy Valenti wrote, Michael Patrick O'Brien was fortunate to come of age under the tutelage of Trappist monks and to enjoy close relationships with men who chose the search for God over the more mundane lures of the world. This beautiful memoir portrays his monastic friends as both exceptional and ordinary, holy and altogether human. In doing so, O'Brien reminds those of us who have been hanging on by our fingertips why we still love the Catholic Church and what it is called to be, a place of service and mercy, a place where, like Holy Trinity Abbey, the core message is love. Jana Reese, another author here at Paraclete, wrote, in July 1847, Mormon pioneers famously arrived in Utah. A century later, in July 1947, some Catholic pioneers followed in their footsteps. Trappist monks bent on creating a contemplative monastery, Holy Trinity Abbey, in the unlikely soil of Mormon country. In this affectionate winning memoir, Michael O'Brien captures the expansive spirit of late 20th century Catholicism in America and the loving warmth of the monks who befriended him. So many beautiful words. Just I'll read one more from um, Brother Columban Weber from the Abbey of Gethsemane. A consummate storyteller, O'Brien shares his remarkable journey by weaving the tale of the Abbey of the Holy Trinity monks with his own search for a life of belonging and meaning. The final result is as entertaining as it is enlightening, an extraordinary contribution and achievement. Again, so many, so many beautiful words. Thank you so much, Michael, for this beautiful book, which had a few delays, but here I told him I'm finally holding a real copy in my hands and it's, it's so beautiful inside and out. So congratulations and um, thank you so much for launching with us today. Thank you. It's good to see you, Rachel. It's good to see the book too. And hearing all those great words, it's kind of like attending your own funeral. So it's nice to have a preview of what, uh, <laughs> you know, what might happen down the road here. <laughs> um, Mike, you know, we were um, sort of talking about what we wanted to talk about for the launch today. And um, I vote, you know, so many of us read memoirs and it's fascinating. And I was thinking about what it takes to write a memoir, especially one like this, that's so personal. And um, is it something that was always in your mind to do or did, did something prompt you to share your story now? You know, I, I love to write. And, you know, as part of my day job as a lawyer, I write a lot, although a different kind of writing. Um, but, you know, literally the moment when I decided I wanted to write something was, is depicted in the, the, the prologue. You know, a, a child ran up the aisle at church and gave a huge hug to the priest who had just finished celebrating mass. Mm -hmm. And it was right in the middle of the whole child abuse scandal. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a meaningful event for me. Um, and right about the same time, I learned that the monastery, which was, of course, a, a near and dear place during my childhood, was closing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought these, these events are related to each other. It's, it's almost a, a revelation to me that um, uh, I can write and help the monks be remembered. Um, and I can also use the uh, uh, occasion of remembering the monks to remind people that there's many, many priests, Catholic priests who cherish children rather than abusing them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the sort of that emerged as the twofold reason for writing the book is I, I want the monks to be remembered, even though the monastery is closing. And then it became a form of almost spiritual therapy for me to go through the process of remembering 
uh, those times and writing about them and sort of working my way through my own uh, uh, concerns and even anger about the, the scandal and, and the way many in the church had covered it up. So those are the, those are the two reasons that led to this particular memoir. There may be many other reasons why people write memoirs, maybe better ones or, or more, uh, uh, you know, more uh, commonly applicable ones. But, but those are the two reasons that I ended up writing this book. Mm-hmm. When you're um, sorting through all those memories, and, and obviously the book is full of so many personal memories, but it's also there's so much history and, um, you know, a, a broader context, even than just your own story here. How do you decide um, what do you keep? What's too personal to share? What, you know what I mean? Um, yes. In terms of your goal for getting the story across, how, how do you do that? Yes, no, another great question. And uh, you know, again, it's the first book I've written. So I don't know that the way I did it is, is recommended for anybody. Um, but, you know, the first thing I did was start to write down the stories because they were rattling around in my head. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to sort of get rid of that noise, I, I needed to write them down. So I wrote down as many of the stories as I could remember. Um, uh, my, uh, my sister, who uh, Karen, who attended the monastery often with us, I'm sure got sick of the emails and the text messages I sent her asking her about what she remembered. And my other sister, Maureen, Mo, uh, you probably got tired of reminding me about things that happened in our childhood because I was the youngest of four children. So, um, but you know, I, I sort of consulted with family um, and then kind of had a collection of, of stories. And, um, you know, there were some significant ones left out. They felt too personal to share. I mean, people who read the book will know which one I'm referring to in particular, you know, particular uh, 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 bad moment that happened to me wasn't even in the first draft of the book uh, uh, because I, I hadn't talked to many people about that and I didn't feel comfortable sharing it. But as I sort of looked at the, the, uh, you know, the bigger picture that was emerging from the memoir of sort of working through my own anger about the, the child abuse scandal. Mm-hmm. Um, this particular event, you know, an example of abuse in my own life that didn't come from the church, but rather where the church and, and priests rescued me from it, mm-hmm. seemed like it was, it was an important part of the story. So, you know, it, it, the, 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 the contents evolved uh, in, in that manner um, and then, you know, I had many other stories in there that were about other nuns and priests in my life who weren't monks. And of course, good editors, I had several good editors, and, and they reminded me that, you know, you can't talk about every single thing that happened to you. So maybe we should focus a little more. Uh, so some good editing uh, helped narrow it down to the, to the book it is today. Mm, wonderful. Um, when you were writing, and you mentioned it, it was partly for your own healing, I think, of course, but it, was there anyone particular you had in mind or a certain type of person that you hoped would read your story and benefit from it? Yes. Yes. I, I think two people in particular, two types of people, you know, a, a lot of people would sort of stumble upon the monastery. They didn't even know it was there. They'd be driving in the beautiful Ogden Valley and, you know, they'd see a sign that said monastery this way. And they'd think, oh, that's interesting. Let's follow the sign. And, and they would end up there and, you know, happen to listen to the monks chant or see the beautiful farm or maybe go into the bookstore and buy a loaf of bread. Um, and then, you know, from time to time during the years that followed, they might visit there again and talk to the monks once in a while. You know, these are, are all sorts of people, religious, non-religious, Catholic, non-Catholic, Latter-day Saints, etc. And I wanted them to read this book because you know, they don't have the opportunity to stumble upon the monastery anymore. It's closed. And I wanted them to maybe stumble upon the monastery and remember the monks by stumbling upon my book. So that's, that's one group of people. Mm-hmm. And then I think there were a lot of people like me, Catholics in particular, who were struggling with the whole scandal and maybe still are. And, um, uh, you know, I, I wanted them to read the book to, to maybe help them see there's a way to work through it. Uh, on, uh, for, for many of us, there's a way to work through it, uh, you know, sort of to start a dialogue with them about how they work through it and, uh, you know, where they are now after having dealt with those issues, uh, either through, you know, anger at the cover up, anger at the church, anger at the scandal. Uh, so, you know, I, I wanted them to read the book too and maybe start a discussion with me about it. Um, 
and then of course anybody who just <clears throat> likes I think good you know stories about uh, uh, you know coming of age in unusual circumstances uh, hopefully they'll be interested in it too yeah absolutely you know thinking about that um, as a kid there you were <laughs> in the middle of these brothers. And I'm sure, you know, sometimes, but not always analyzing the moments as they came upon you. But when you look back, um, is there something that strikes you as like the most important thing that you learned there that you've sort of carried into your life today? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, I probably was in my 20s when I realized that not everybody grew up around monks. So <laughs> I, I knew I was, I was uh, special, uh, air quotes. Um, but, you know, I, I think in, in the book, I talk about the monk's vows, the five vows they take, and how I've sort of tried to translate those into my own life. You know, for example, you know, as a father and a grandfather, I haven't taken a vow of celibacy, obviously. So I had to translate that vow into something that worked for, you know, a monk in the world, if you will. And for me, that was the notion of devotion. So certainly, I've, I, you know, a very important thing I've done is, is tried to translate those vows, those promises they made into a, a, a life outside of a monastery. But even more important, perhaps, is the monks had this remarkable ability to live in the moment. You know, I mean, obviously, they had concerns and worries and, and uh, you know, they had to deal with the future and the uncertainty of life. But they had this remarkable placid nature where you would be with them and suddenly your cares would melt away. You could live and breathe in the moment that you were actually in with them. And I think seeing that example for 10 years has helped me do that better in my own life. Father Patrick, one of my friends who still survives from the monastery, calls it the sacrament of the now moment. Um, you know, the past is the past and God will take care of the future. So live for today, live in today. Don't let this moment pass by. And I, I, I don't know that I would have learned that lesson as effectively if I hadn't spent 10 years growing up there. I love that. Um, if, if it were possible for you to go back and relive any of those particular boyhood moments with the brothers at the Abbey, would you, or is there a particular memory that you treasure the most? Uh, I'd love to go back um, because, you know, like all... Uh, you know, snot-nosed kids. I don't know that I appreciated it as much then as I would have now, knowing how important it was to me. Uh, I'd like to go back and have conversations with them. You know, as a having the benefit of having lived 60 years and and having the benefit of of uh, knowing the positive influence they'd have on me. You know, there are so many conversations that I just don't remember uh, with them, even as you know scrutinizing my my memories uh, to write this book there's just you know I, I wish I had recorded uh you know my encounters so I could go back and study them I'd, I'd like to do that um of course I just miss them uh I'm too uh and then you know the the other thing I'd like to have done is uh, got married I got married at age 28 and you know we had I had job children responsibilities um and I just wasn't able to spend as much time up there as the monks were in their latter years. And so, you know, I, I didn't see some of them for long stretches of time. And uh, uh, I, I wish I had been able to spend more time with them then. Uh, so those would probably be the things I would do if I could do things over. How wonderful then to bring them back to life in the way that you have through all yeah. these stories where that, you know, having read the book, I feel like I know them a little bit more now. So Good. that's it's a real working. gift. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> you know, um, lest anyone think that you had to have been a young man once to fully appreciate this book. <laughs> one, one of the characters in this story that um, I so admired was your mother. <laughs> yes. And I uh, thought, you know, what courage for her to, to pack you and your sister in the car at the time and struggle up the mountain in the car and, you know, appear on the doorstep of these monks at this abbey and um, be so vulnerable as to just make her need known and to, to help push you in that direction too. Um, and I just thought, wow, is there a model there for, for parents and kids today looking to build their faith, to help their kids find faith, um, to, to find some healing in the midst of everything going on? 
Yes, you know, um, there is, I think. And again, I, I go back to the, to the vows that the monks took um, because one of the vows they took is the vow of stability. And they have a, they have a really interesting, on, on their website at one point, they had a really interesting description of what this vow means. And I just want to read it to you briefly, if I, if I may. Uh, by our vow of stability, we promise to commit ourselves for life to one community of brothers or sisters with whom we will work out our salvation in faith, hope, and love. Resisting all temptation to escape the truth about ourselves by restless movement from one place to the next, we gradually entrust ourselves to God's mercy experienced in the company of brothers or sisters who know us and accept us as we are. Uh, you know, Dorothy Day, I, I think, wrote, you know, that the, about the long loneliness and how the, the remedy for the long loneliness is community. Um, and I, I think that's the model, right? It, it's not a unique or new model, right? It's been around for a long time. But that's what the monks ultimately gave us was community. Um, and we each have to find our communities where we can uh, grow and thrive and, and uh, you know, where we can be in a place where it's okay to curl up in the fetal position on the floor for a few days if we need to. And, and uh, you know, the, the, I think that's the model is, is, is where, do we, where do we find that community? Uh, you know, if, if, if we don't have it in a monastery, do we have it in friends? Do we have it in family? Do we have it in family of choice, the people that we add to our lives who aren't blood relatives but become our family? Uh, I think that's what helped us was having that community. And, and uh, I think that's what people need to look for. Yeah, it's so true. Um, and, you know, there was your mother, your, your father wasn't so much a part of your life at that time, but the spiritual fatherhood that you experienced with the monks was so um, amazing and generous and so wholesome. And it's such an example to me of God's love for us. Um, in the, again, in the time that we're living in now, how do you see this type of healed relationship being built in the church? Well, you know, I, uh, I think life is a harvest in many ways. Uh, and when we harvest uh, our lives, we, what do we collect? Both wheat and chaff, right? Um, and we have to sort we have to sort through and, and find the wheat in our life and, and eliminate the chaff. Uh, and I, I think that's how healing occurs it, it is through that harvest and through that sorting. And that's what I had to do in terms of my own relationship with the church, right? There were, uh, you know, there was a lot of chaff, uh, especially uh, as I grew angry at the scandal and the cover up. Um, but writing this book helped me realize there was a lot of wheat too. Uh, and help me find the wheat. And I think in any of our relationships, you know, it's for better or for worse. It's a totality of the circumstances sort of, of thing. And what we have to do is harvest uh, and sort and find the wheat. Love that, thank you. Um, Mike, I know you had some photos and some particular things that you wanted to share from your story. Yes. No, I can practice law, but screen sharing always terrorizes me a little bit. So let's see if I can do it here. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So can you see that okay? I sure can. Okay, wonderful. Um, I do call you, this my. I think you I, might still be in presenter mode if you want to share. Um, okay, I'll try to swap that. Okay. Sorry, I'm not getting no my, problem. my swap option, so. We can still see it, that's for sure. Okay, well, see what I mean? This is why I'm terrified about screen sharing. <laughs> we all sympathize, <laughs> the, the year of Zoom. This new Zoom world that we're in. <laughs> um, uh, I'll just it's go okay. ahead and present yeah, it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so this is, this is like a family album for me. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a PowerPoint presentation of photos from the monastery archives and from my own uh, uh, family photos. Um, 
this photo here uh, that you can see it is myself and Brother Boniface, who uh, has a whole chapter devoted to him in the book, um, who is very meaningful to me in, in, in many, many ways. Um, and I know we, don't, <clears throat> we only have a little bit of time here, so I'll probably go through these way too quickly. Um, but um, in 1947, the monks arrived here in Utah, in the Ogden Valley, almost 75 years ago. And these are wonderful photos from uh, the day of arrival and from their train trip from Kentucky. Uh, they stayed in army barracks uh, uh, that uh, German and Italian prisoners of war had stayed in when they were uh, housed here in, in Utah during World War II. Uh, and they immediately got to work in building a, a farm out of what was a, a rough uh, hunting ranch almost uh, up in the southeastern part of the Ogden Valley. Um, and that process uh, involved a lot of work. And of course, they had a lot of labor, uh, you know, to help them do it. But uh, I love these photos of, you know, the, them living in the barracks and, and using uh, horses and buggies to uh, try to uh, create a farm out of, out of the, uh, the sage that covered the land. Um, uh, yet also taking time to, uh, you know, do what they are supposed to do as monks, which is to pray and and be contemplative. Uh, the ultimate product of their work, of course, was this beautiful monastery uh, that maybe some of you have seen before, but maybe some of you haven't. They ended up using Quonset Hut to create this really unique uh, building. Um, uh, I looked through old newspaper articles from the late 1940s, and actually there were several articles written about what was perhaps the only Quonset Hut monastery in the world. Uh, but it turned into this beautiful, unique space. Um, and I, um, at one point they looked at building a, a stone monastery. You can see that in the upper left-hand corner. Um, but uh, ultimately they chose not to do that, either for reasons of funds or or other reasons, and uh, the the temporary Quonset Hut Monastery turned out to be the monastery they lived in for 70 years. Uh, in the epilogue of the book, I, I write a little bit um, uh, about my last visit there, and I want to uh, read that to you because I think it's a nice way to launch into some of the other readings, uh, because again, in writing this book, what I was doing was looking backwards. This is from uh, the epilogue. And uh, actually it was four years ago today on August 17th, Rachel, that I, I last visited the monastery before it closed. Um, I visited the Abbey, my own home away from home for the last time in August, 2017, just before it closed. It was my final monastery morning. I sat alone in the church and watched the colored lights of the stained glass window dance in perfect synchronicity with the silent echoes of 70 years of monk voices raised in chant. I walked down the tree-lined Abbey Road. The road cuts a path between two of the fields, both abundantly filled on that day with a late summer growth of alfalfa hay. I saw dozens of small white butterflies gently fluttering between the fragrant green plants. It was a dreamlike vision, almost as if all of my boyhood memories had taken to winged flight just so they and I could be together quietly and one last time in that lovely place where we first had met. And of course, one of the most interesting scenes in the book occurs on the, the lawn just outside of the chapel. Um, and I wanna briefly read uh, a few excerpts from uh, chapter one uh, about that. I was actually standing on the lawn um, and the monks had a guest uh, a famous theologian. Um, I don't remember his name. I, I've done a lot of research and I can't uh, remember his name. And, and unfortunately, my friends, the monks don't remember either. But he was there and we were talking uh, in this beautiful setting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so here's a little bit of excerpt from that story. I was a good conversationalist for a preteen, perhaps because of my Irish heritage, genetic blarney implanted in my DNA. I also was a voracious reader, arming me with a ready arsenal of surprisingly clever things to say that one might not ordinarily expect from someone my age. I was 11, by the way. 
A few weeks earlier, I had read a promotional pamphlet about the Abbey in the monastery bookstore. A phrase it used to describe the Abbey caught my attention. I did not know exactly how to respond when the theologian during our conversation commented on the magnificent setting for the conversation. So I simply repeated the descriptive comment I had read in the monastery pamphlet to remarkable effect. The conversation stopped suddenly. The theologian paused and looked at me with an odd expression on his bearded face. He seemed surprised and a little impressed. Or maybe he just thought I was a shameless plagiarist because he asked me politely if I knew that the words I had just mindlessly repeated like a parrot were from a famous poem written by a well-known poet. Of course, I had no idea about either the poem or the poet. I just liked the words and the phrase. I had assumed that T.S. Eliot was just some guy like me who had visited Holy Trinity Abbey and been fortunate enough to get his name and clever comment reprinted in the monastery brochure. Looking back at my conversation now, many decades later, my preteen self deserves more credit for insight, accidental as it was, than I gave him then. That young man somehow recognized, perhaps subconsciously, that he actually was standing at the still point of the turning world. So that's how I discovered T.S. Eliot, was through the monks, the brochure, and I had no idea who he was, but of course I was free to quote him. It truly is the still point of the turning world though. And I think you can see that in these lovely images of the land. The monks of course were hard workers and that's how they sustained themselves for 70 years. They, they were famous for their bread, uh, for their honey operations, for their farm. Uh, throughout their working days, of course, they took time to spend uh, a few moments with the animals on the farm, uh, with the cows, Father Patrick in the upper left-hand corner, um, uh, with the piglets in the left hand, uh, lower left-hand corner, that's Brother Norbert, Michael Flaherty was his name from Pittsburgh. And then of course, uh, one of the monks with a, a, a porcupine. The eggs in the middle, that, that was a job that I often helped with. Uh, again, helped in air quotes because I was 11 or 12 years old at, at the beginning of my visits. Um, and I, I did that with Brother Boniface, uh, who again was a very important figure to me. Um, so I want to read just a short excerpt, excerpt from chapter seven about working with Brother Boniface and the chickens. Uh, again, sometimes I would, I would actually uh, have assigned jobs, uh, but as you'll see here in, in the, the reading, there were other times when I didn't have an assigned job. There were other times I would just try to stay out of the way. I liked to walk around the massive coop and pretend I was talking with the chickens. I never meant to frighten them, but sometimes if I got too close to the cages, wings would flap and feathers would fly. Brother Bond lovingly tended to his chickens. He would often make indecipherable comforting and reassuring cooing or humming sounds, almost as if he was singing to them. Unlike my own more guttural sounds, the hens recognized his voice and calmed as he walked by. It reminded me of the story I once heard in school about how St. Francis preached to the birds. Our teacher showed us a painting from the upper church of the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi, created by the Renaissance artist Giotto, which depicts the famous scene. In the painting, more than a dozen birds recline peacefully beneath a tree, watching and listening as Francis tells them how much God loves them and cares for them. Brother Boniface did the same thing with his thousands of clucking chickens. Um, last March, again, I, I have a continuing relationship with the monks, and last March, I joined Father Patrick and the current landowner, Bill White, for what the monks call the blessing of the fields, where they every spring bless the fields and pray for a, 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 good, uh, a good crop and a fertile harvest. Um, and when we were up there, Father Patrick said something that reminded me of, of Brother Boniface singing to the chickens. Um, he, he said that every time a monk lift a bale, lifted a bale of hay out there in the field, it was a prayer. I, I think Brother Boniface, when he was singing to the chickens, was praying and blessing them. Uh, and that's an image that uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget. 
the, the monks did scholarly work, of course. Uh, there's Father Thomas, who was actually one of the editors or censors for Thomas Merton in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, uh, Brother uh, uh, Nicholas in the upper right-hand corner made beautiful clocks, one of which I purchased before the monastery closed. And in the upper, excuse me, the lower right-hand corner, you see Father Bartholomew, who was a scholar, uh, but also developed this wonderful honey product that the monks sold for many, many years. And of course, the monks were always at prayer, right? Ora et labora, the, the, the Latin for uh, prayer and work, uh, which was their, their motto. Um, and uh, that prayer occurred, of course, in their beautiful Quonset Hut Chapel with the stained glass window that I love. And that now is actually in a, another church in, in South Ogden, about a half hour from my, my hometown here. Um, they prayed uh, while they worked, of course, they prayed in the fields and the image of a, a monk in his white robes watching the sprinklers and, and thanking God for, uh, for water that particular year, uh, again, is a beautiful image. But one of my favorite times, of course, to be in the monastery chapel was at night in the dark, either with the, the light just barely illuminating the monks as they chanted or with the stained glass window um, uh, lit up as well. Uh, it was a brotherhood, uh, and even I, as a 11, 12, 13 year old, could see that. Um, and it was a brotherhood that extended, you know, from cradle to grave. Um, the image of Brother Felix in the upper left hand corner comforting Father Jerome uh, as he lay sick uh, is, is, is a lovely image. Uh, you see the monks uh, sitting on a rock, they just climbed a nearby mountain together. Um, you see them baking bread together. And then in one of the most striking images uh, of monastic life, you see the very simple uh, burial uh, where the monks were buried right in the ground without coffin, without any sort of, uh, of the uh, rituals that we associate with traditional burials, the coffin, the flowers. Um, it was the brothers who would stay up all night before the funeral with their, with their brother who had passed on or graduated to heaven as the monks like to say. And then there was a simple burial of the monk in his robe uh, right in the ground. It was a beautiful brotherhood. Of course, we were privileged as you will see in the book to sort of uh, get a glimpse of that life. And that's what Monastery Mornings talks about. Um, uh, a couple of family photos uh, in the middle there. Uh, again, sorry about the, the small number of them. Uh, Given our, you know, the fact that we have these cell phones today and we, we photograph everything, I'm, I'm stunned at how rarely we seem to photograph things back in the 1970s and 80s. But luckily, we do have a few photos from that time of us with the monks um, and with Mother Teresa when she visited. Uh, she was a good friend of Brother Nicholas. Um, and we, were, we got some insider information on the day she uh, visited the monastery and were able to, to come and sit right behind her in the church. Um, and take some photos of her walking around the Abbey grounds and uh, uh, walking with her friend, Brother Nicholas, up to the church. Uh, Mike, I love, I love that particular story from the book when you as a young man were up around the altar, but your mother and sister were back with Mother Teresa. Do you, can you tell that story quickly for us? Yes, I, yes, I love that story. And I'll, I'll tell that in honor of my dear sister, Karen. She'll love hearing me admit it uh, verbally. <laughs> But um, the, as a young male, I could go up around the front of the altar and stand with the monks during part of the mass. Uh, and women at the time weren't allowed to do that. So my sister and mom were always in the back. And, you know, of course, I mean, I was a, I was a nice kid, but I, I wasn't beyond gloating around my sister whenever I got the chance. And I would gloat to her that I got to go up front and she didn't. Well, on the day that Mother Teresa visited, we were sitting right behind her in the balcony of the, of the church. And at the point of time in the mass where the males got to go front, I went up front. And that happened to be the point in time when the Catholics uh, do what's called the sign of the peace. Uh, and we shake hands with each other. Well, at least we did before COVID times. Um, and during that moment, when I'm way up in the front of the church, guess what? Mother Teresa turns around and shakes hands and chats with my mother and sister. And the very thing my sister did as soon as mass ended was remind me that she was the one who got to shake hands with someone who may someday be a saint. Uh, she turned the tables on me on the gloating on that day. And uh, I think she still smiles about how well she turned the tables and how she can still do it to this very day. 
because it was the day I almost met Mother Teresa, where in fact she actually got to meet her. Um, it's a friendship with the monks that lasts, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, briefly, let me just uh, show you a brief tribute to the monks I knew back in 79. Pictures of them, uh, you know, during those years. Um, if we had more time again, I could tell stories about each of them. But if you look at the uh, uh, right hand uh, side, the individual photo, second from the bottom, there's a monk there named Father Jerome. Um, and after college, I went up to visit him in a retreat. And he kept telling me uh, to go visit the Newman Center when I was in, in law school. The Newman Center, of course, was the Catholic Church associated with the University of Utah. Uh, and I did it, and that's where I met my wife. And so I actually give Father Jerome credit for being my monk matchmaker. Um, of course, many, many stories like that in the book about the wonderful things these uh, kind-hearted men did for me and my family. And we're still friends today, which is a, a, a real blessing. Um, so you see some photos, uh, you know, from uh, more current times. Uh, my family in the lower left-hand corner, my uh, two daughters, my son-in-law and my son, um, right there on what I call Abbey Road with the beautiful view of Mount Ogden behind them. That's in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, some photos of a recent visit with the monks in the lower right-hand corner, the, the surviving monks. Uh, last June, we got together with them, drove them up to Huntsville, uh, where we rededicated the statue of Mary that's in their cemetery. Uh, and that's up in uh, the upper left-hand corner of this slide. Uh, it, the statue is called Mary, Our Lady of Confidence. Um, and she had been in the monastery since 1950 in various places. Initially, she was up front of, in the church, and then she was moved into their garden courtyard, and then finally in, into the, the cemetery. Um, and the statue had deteriorated terribly. Um, and uh, Bill White, again, a great friend of the monks and a generous uh, supporter of the monks, we worked together to, to restore the statue. Um, uh, 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 a sculptor from Evanston, Wyoming came and got it and restored it and brought it back. And in June, we were able to rededicate it. And then we went and had a delicious barbecue at Bill White's house. The monks love to go to barbecues at Bill White's house, by the way, because they always look forward to Elaine White's potato salad and her cookies. Uh, so every one of my kids have met the monks. Um, uh, they've had conversations with them. My nieces have met the monks. And it's just been a joy uh, for us to be able to continue to do that. It shows to me that the monastery has been a matter of, of addition rather than subtraction in our lives. You know, when it closed, it wasn't like something was subtracted from our lives. Instead, we've been able to have an ongoing relationship with the monastery with the surviving monks, uh, with uh, Bill and Elaine White, and with their friends who are working to preserve the, the monk's legacy in Huntsville. Um, and it's been a, a blessing and a joy. Of course, the monastery closed in 2017. The monks had aged. They didn't have as many vocations as they needed to sustain uh, the abbey. Um, and in 2017, uh, uh, the monastery closed. Uh, in a lovely tribute, the neighboring town of Huntsville made the monks the grand marshals of their annual July 4th parade. And, and the photo in the upper left-hand corner shows uh, the monks being driven around Huntsville, waving to the crowds. <clears throat> and the man who's driving them around is a wonderful person too. His name is Quinn McKay. He's a descendant of uh, uh, the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the time, David O. McKay, who was a Huntsville native. There was a wonderful friendship that developed between the monks and uh, the saints, the Latter-day Saints who lived nearby. Um, and uh, that's, I think, most vividly demonstrated in that photo. And then, of course, I mentioned that Bill uh, lovingly, lovingly cares for the monks. He, he tends their grave, uh, uh, grave sites, their cemetery. Uh, uh, that's on private property now, but Bill uh, ensures that it's, it's uh uh, kept up in, in a beautiful manner. Um, and in fact, the story of, of the, the monks and the, the friendships they developed with their neighbors is so compelling to me, uh, Rachel, that I've actually uh, been writing another book about that. It's called In the Valley of Monks and Saints. Mm -hmm. And if I may, I want to just read a brief uh, uh, paragraph from that new book. Um, this is talking about uh, Bill White and his friendship with the monks. 
When the Trappist monks arrived at the site of their future monastery in the Ogden Valley on July 10, 1947, their leader, Kentucky Abbot Frederick A. Dunn, softly declared, I think this place is near to heaven, and it should be our endeavor to make it more so. For 70 years, the Utah monks did, excuse me, did just that and created a little bit of heaven on earth. Bill White, God bless him, is trying to keep it that way. So Bill, who's also a lawyer, uh, a water lawyer, has been working for many years to establish a conservation easement and preserve the land. The monks didn't want their land to become a golf course or a subdivision, not that they have anything against either one of those things, but this is sacred land. Um, it was farmed for many, many years and they had hoped that somehow that could continue. Uh, and Bill has, uh, with the help of many others, including the Summit Land Conservancy and the Ogden Valley Land Trust, um, has raised the money to put the land under a conservation easement. So uh, the farming will go on for many, many more years uh, in memory of, of the monks. Uh, and Bill's not a Catholic. Bill's not even a monk. Uh, I call him, though, the new novice. Uh, the man who's taking care of the legacy of the monastery, along with many others, a community of people yeah. who love yeah. the monks. Um, and so it's completely possible that someday, 50 years from now, somebody will walk on that land, walk on that road, reading bits and pieces of my book and watching the farm work that Bill White is continuing to make possible at the Abbey of the Holy Trinity. It's so heartening. Um, even that that photo of the the Fourth of July parade with the monks as the grand marshals reminds me of those um, towns in Europe, you know, where the abbey is the heart of things and everyone lives around it. And how amazing that, that happened in Huntsville in the mountains. There is just um, just so incredible. Well, and it could have been a much different story, right? Mm -hmm. I mean the. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Latter-day Saints, the Saints and the monks could have been enemies. Um, Absolutely, yeah. They, they dearly loved each other. And mm -hmm. if you go and talk to any of the neighbors, um, they, they mourn the loss of the monastery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, they remember them uh, with great affection. And you're helping to keep that memory alive through this book. So thank you for sharing it with us. And now I'll see if I can unshare my screen. Uh, <laughs> Well, while Michael's doing that, um, if if any of you attending today have any questions or thoughts or um, things that you'd like to share, please feel free to do that. You can raise your hand or use the chat bar, or use the Q&A button. Um, I'll just let you know, too, for, for anyone attending, a video of our conversation today will be available later on YouTube or you can watch it again on Facebook. And um, We've also been lucky to receive from Michael some footage of um, the property up at the Abbey and yourself there. So, so we'll be, um, we're putting together, our videographer here is putting together some lovely pieces so that um, you too can, can see that land, not just in your imagination and in these photos and reading the book, but um, actually see it. So we thank you, Mike, and thank you to your daughter for, for that lovely footage. It's such a beautiful place. It was fun getting that footage, Rachel, because we uh, we had a sunroof in the car, and um, we have a famous story in our family about how once I, I made my wife try and videotape a ride down a, a canyon road during the fall to catch the foliage, and she got horribly dizzy. Said, Don't ever make me do that again. So our oldest daughter got to do it uh, uh, standing uh, through the top of the sunroof, uh, Aaron, our oldest daughter, and, and videotaping while I drove around. and. She was happy to do it. I was thrilled she did it. And my wife, Vicki, was thrilled that she didn't have to do it. Well, well, we'll all be lucky enough to see it. So, so we'll release those as, as we can as, as um, this book takes flight into the world. Um, if any of you are please don't don't be shy feel free to submit any questions or thoughts you might have and um, while you're doing that I'll just let you know that um, Monastery Mornings really is available wherever books are sold and at Paraclete, we always encourage you to visit your local bookseller first. And if they don't happen to carry Monastery Mornings, have them get in touch with us. We'll be happy to help them make it available. And of course, it's available on all your through all your online retailers too. But um, one way that you can help spread the word about 
the story help spread the word about um, the Abbey there is to just take a minute once you've read it to share a review. And you can do that on our website. You can do it on Goodreads. You can do it on Amazon, your own social media platforms, really um, anywhere that you want to talk about this book and, and share your personal experience with it too will, um, will only help us continue to, you know, spread the story. It's um, so hopeful and so healing. And although it's, it's your story, Mike, I know that um, I certainly have, and anyone who reads it will find um, so much here <laughs> just to strengthen connections between ourselves and our, each other and the Lord. So um, here comes a question, I think, from John Segrist. He says, um, great presentation. I am a lay associate at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. I was wondering if any of the Huntsville monks were located to other monasteries. Great question. You know, of course, the Huntsville monks were uh, 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 originated from Gethsemane. Um, and when their monastery closed, they returned to Gethsemane. So they're the Utah branch of Gethsemane now. And we're thrilled to have a, a Utah branch of Gethsemane. Uh, some of the monks did relocate. Two of them went to uh, Abbey of the Genesee mm. in, uh, in New York. My friend, uh, Brother David, who used to run the honey operations, he's still there. And we write to each other from time to time. Um, another monk, uh, Brother Cyril, uh, went there but recently passed away. Uh, Father Charles uh, Cummins, for a time, was the, the chaplain to the Trappistine Monastery uh, in Virginia. Um, and he was planning to, to relocate to the uh, Trappist Monastery in, in uh, Bina, California, known for their wine production. Um, I'm going to have to visit that one. Uh, and uh, uh, he was out there planning his, his relocation when he passed away. And so he ended up uh, there where he wanted to be, and he's buried in their, in their cemetery. The other monks thought about, uh, you know, where to relocate, um, and uh, Father Patrick Boyle actually visited Gethsemane and considered moving back there, um, but ultimately they all decided to stay together. Uh, so there's, the remaining monks moved to a retirement community here in Salt Lake uh, that helps provide, you know, uh, needed medical care and assisted living, um, and there are, are five of them living there right now from Holy Trinity. And then one of the monks from Kentucky is staying there, uh, Brother Colombo, uh, who has been a wonderful addition to that group as well. So there's five surviving Utah monks um, at St. Joseph's Villa in Salt Lake and, and one Kentucky monk. And they sort of have a little monastery within the, the, uh, the villa uh, there, and they're making their, their lovely presence known there now. That's great. Elizabeth was asking how many of the original monks are still living today. Yes, five of them. Five of them. That's yeah. great. Father Patrick, Father Allen, Father Leander, Father Casimir, uh, and Father David. Mm -hmm. And uh, four of them are former abbots. Uh, and one of them, Father Allen, was the superior there for a time. So uh, mm -hmm. the, those are the, the ones who are, who are left and who we, we take up to Huntsville whenever they can go and give them potato salad and chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> James McCann says, wonderful presentation. I've been associated with New Mallory Abbey and Holy Cross for the past 20 years. Love the monks. You know, we have a, a Utah connection to New Mallory too, because the last superior at Holy Trinity was Father Brendan Freeman, mm. um, who was a former abbot at New Mallory. And so we got to know him as well. And he helped the monks make that transition. And recently he's been in Ireland trying to help uh, save some of the Trappist monasteries there. So, so we, we claim a nice connection to New Mallory too. Um, Kathleen says, I'm curious, that's perfect. I'm curious to know where Brendan Freeman went once the monastery closed. So that's yes. where he is. Yeah, he's, he's in Ireland. Uh, uh, he was here in June, as you saw in some of the photos for the rededication of the statue. He had a Dickens of a time getting back with COVID oh, tests yeah. and, and all of those, but he, he made it back. Um, and uh, I, I think the plan is for sometime soon uh, for him to return to New Mellorey uh, mm. because they're uh, putting a, another leadership uh, structure in place at uh, Mellifont Abbey is where he's at in, in Ireland. Uh, so Bill White was able to go and visit with him there in Ireland and, and several of their friends. And uh, they had a nice uh, stay at that monastery with Father Brendan. 
I just love all the, the, the Travis connections that, you know, certainly people who are associated with the Abbey know, but I think about folks who love fruitcake or <laughs> now yeah. the, the Spencer Abbey ale. And I think how many people <laughs> know yeah. the spiritual blessings that they're also receiving when they take part in these gifts? <laughs> yeah, the Spencer Abbey ale is, is especially a good one. The, we don't get that here in Utah, but we get in the, the state liquor stores, we can get some of the Belgium Trappist uh, mm-hmm, beer, mm-hmm. Um, and I won't name names, but every once in a while I do go on beer runs for the surviving months so they can have some Trappist beer. It's only appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Anita is asking, are the monastery grounds open to the public? My son just moved to Huntsville and I would love to visit their land. Um, you know, they're, they're not open to the public like they were before, but Bill White has been very generous uh, about helping people see that land. So contact me, send me an email um, and uh, I can get you in touch with Bill um, and uh, you can contact him and and make arrangements to see the property. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Oh, Rebecca, I think missed this. She's asking, did these monks come from Gethsemane, Kentucky? Yes, so 33 of them uh, took a train uh, in July of 1947 from Gethsemane. Uh, the last founder who, who rode on that train, Father Malachi Flaherty, passed away a couple of years ago. So the surviving monks uh, arrived at Holy Trinity, you know, in 1950 and later. They weren't uh, part of the founders. Um, but yes, they were, they were Gethsemane monks uh, to start with, and um, they've now returned to that, that home. You know, Thomas Merton wrote a lot about, by the way, about... Uh, that process of developing the Utah monastery and sending monks from Kentucky to Utah. I, I think reading between the lines of his journals that, that he maybe wanted to go to Utah and we would have loved to have him of course, but I, I don't know that any abbot would have given up Thomas Merton. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't get him, <laughs> but we're happy with what we got. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. That, that seems to bring us to the end of our questions. We do have a few more minutes if anyone wants to sneak some in. Um, but I'll just, oh, here's one. Let's see. Click my button here. Oh, your email address, Bill. Um, Anita's asking, so she can ask you that. Yes. Um, go to joneswaldo.com, which is my law firm, um, and you can get it there. Great. I'll just post that, Anita, as an answer to your question. So you can get in touch with Mike. Wonderful. Yes. I look forward to communicating with you, Anita. Fantastic. Um, If anyone would like to order Monastery Mornings from Paraclete Press, as we mentioned earlier, if you use the coupon code MONASTIC, you'll get 20% off your order. And um, really do encourage you to consider this for your book club or your small group, um, your parents group, just uh, people of all ages and, and, and walks can gain so much from this fantastic book and the story that Mike has shared with us. So thank you again, Michael. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And um, our prayers are with everyone for continued health and safety. And um, we hope you'll enjoy the book. We'll be thinking of you, Mike, with all your events for spreading the word about the book and certainly with um, all the work that you're doing to preserve the land there. Thank you. And I, I, I promised I wouldn't cry, Rachel, but you made me cry when I read one of the passages. So I apologize for that, but there's a lot of love there. Well, it's not even my story and I cry every time I read it. So it's okay with me. <laughs> thank you for, and thank you for the wonderful help and support from Paraclete Press. Absolutely. It's our privilege. Thank you to everyone. And um, keep an eye on paracletepress.com for future online events. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Take care, everyone.